Good morning, everyone. The time for convening has arrived. The Senate will come to order. At this time, I will ask all unauthorized personnel to exit the chamber. Recognize the senator from the 28th to give us a reading of the journal. Good morning, Mr. President. Happy Monday to you. And happy birthday to the man in black. American country singer Johnny Cash was born today, back in 1932. And today is National Letter to an Elder Day. So I'll expect you to be sending me a letter today. We got a great lineup of pages today, and we got plenty of work for him to do with 18 bills on the floor. Out of Atlanta, we have Carrington Manus. Out of Peachtree City, we have brother and sister Elijah and Sophia Merkley. Their granddaddy's a good friend of mine. He's with us today. Out of Gainesville, we have Patrick Lovell. Out of Lula, we have Ryan Pitts. Out of Alapaha, we have Kelsey Murray. Out of Brunswick, we have Zachary Reed. Out of St. Simons, we have Morgan Wainwright. Out of Roswell, we have A.J. Fernandez. Out of Atlanta, we have George Jeffers. Out of Alpharetta, we have Faluke Aladajai. Out of Gayson, um, maybe that's Grayson, we have Riley Scott. Out of Woodstock, we have Cash White. Out of Alpharetta, we have Joshua Lynn. Out of Calhoun, we have Nathan Eichmann. Out of Lawrenceville, we have Nathan Luau. Out of, also out of Lawrenceville, we have Ryan Tan. Out of Alpharetta, we have Kate Ding. Out of Cumming, we have Cy Gudametla. Out of Cumming, we have Mason Ty. Out of Milledgeville, we got a string of folks here with Helen Ann Davenport, Emma Giles, Hayden Henry, and Kylie Moody. And I'm just notified that the senator from the 25th granddaughter is Emma Giles. So y'all give our pages a big round of applause. We appreciate y'all being here. Look forward to working with y'all today. <laughs> lots to do, lots of good stuff we're gonna be doing for the great state of Georgia. Mr. President, this journal has been read and found to be correct. All right, Senator, that sounds good. We do have a lot of pages and we thank each and every one of y'all for being here and participating in the page program we've got a big a big crowd today actually this might be the largest one i've seen yet so uh mr chairman you also forgot to mention our dis fine distinguished longtime uh member and colleague uh steve senator steve henson is here today so <laughs> he looks fresh and froggy like everybody who leaves this chamber. They always look a little younger after they come back a little bit. So glad to have you here, Steve. So, is there objection to the dispensing of the reading of the journal? Chair hears none, the reading of the journal is dispensed with. Is there objection to the confirmation of the journal? Chair hears none, the journal is confirmed. All senators who have bills and resolutions introduced, please bring them to the secretary's desk. First reading references the Senate bills and resolutions. Senate Bill 555 by Senators Williams of the 25th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend code section 48-8-3 of the OCGA relating to exemptions from sales and use taxes so as to finance. Senate Bill 556 by Senator Halpern of the 39th, a bill to be entitled an act to amend chapter two of title 20. Education of and youth. Senate Resolution 670 by Senator Watson of the 11th, a resolution proposing an amendment to the constitution so as to increase finance. the- Senate Resolution 677 by Senators Dixon of the 45th and others, a resolution creating the Senate credit Rules. card. Senate Resolution 678 by Senators Rahman of the 5th and others, a resolution supporting a Rules. state goal. 
Senate Resolution 687 by Senator Gooch of the 51st, a resolution urging the University of North Georgia and the University System of Georgia Board of Regents to name a certain building after former speaker. Higher education. That completes the order, Mr. President. First reading references to House bills. House Bill 579 by Representatives Baird of the 24th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 33 of Chapter 2. Education and Youth. House Bill 843 by Representative Stevens of the 164th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Regulated Chapter 3. Regulated Industries. House Bill 934 by Representatives Montahan of the 17th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article Judiciary. 5. Judiciary. House Bill 986 by Representatives Thomas of the 21st and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 21 of the OCGA. Judiciary. House Bill 993 by Representatives Powell of the 33rd and others, a bill to be entitled an act to Judiciary. amend. Judiciary. House Bill 1049 by Representatives Williamson of the 112th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter <coughs> 52 of Interest Title. Interest and Labor. House Bill 1073 by Representatives Washburn of the 144th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Code Section. State and Local Government General. House Bill 1114 by Representatives Wade of the 9th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Title 33 of the Insurance and Labor. House Bill 1124 by Representatives Martin of the 49th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Sub Higher Education. House Bill 1170 by Representatives Hawkins of the 27th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2A of Title 31 of the OCGA relating to the Department of Public Health so as to require Health and Human Services. House Bill 1199 by Representatives Perkle of the 169th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Code Section 50. Government Oversight. House Bill 1203 by Representatives Kelly of the 16th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Article 3 of Chapter 7 of Judiciary. Title 34. House Bill 1207 by Representatives Fleming of the 114th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to Ethics. amend. House Bill 1268 by Representatives Hawkins of the 27th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to State and local government. House Bill 1269 by Representatives Hawkins of the 27th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend to provide for a new homestead exemption. State and local government. House Bill 1270 by Representatives Hawkins of the 27th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to provide a new homestead exemption for all State and local government. House Bill 1271 by Representatives Hawkins of the 27th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to provide a new homestead exemption. State and local government. House Bill 1273 by Representative Workheiser of the 157th, a bill to be entitled State and local government. That completes the order, Mr. President. Secretary Reed, actually, hold on. Um, Senator from the 50th, you have your light on. For what purpose do you rise? Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. President. State your inquiry. Is it true the distinguished rules chairman was wearing reading glasses? And if so, can we accurately reflect that in the journal? Could you say that a little louder, Senator? I couldn't, I couldn't hear you. Was the rules chairman wearing reading glasses today? And if so, could we reflect that in the journal? Oh, yeah. He's getting old, Senator. This happens. So we'll reflect it, though. We'll reflect it. It will get worse. You just wait there. You just wait, Senator from the 50th. Secretary will read reports of standing committee. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Banking and Financial Institutions has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 451 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Summers of the 13th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Economic Development and Tourism has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 489 do pass, Senate Bill 496 do pass, Senate Bill 518 do pass, Senate Bill 503 do pass, Senate Bill 4547 do pass, Senate Resolution 623 do pass, Senate Bill 543 do pass by substitute, Senate Resolution 538 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Beach of the 21st District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Economic Development and Tourism has had under, cons under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 534 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Beach of the 21st District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Judiciary has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 180 do pass, Senate Bill 320 do pass by substitute, Senate Bill 533 do pass, Senate Bill 425 do pass by substitute, Senate Bill 523 do pass by substitute, Senate Bill 517 do pass, and Senate Bill 201 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Strickland of the 17th District Chairman. Mr. Secretary, pursuant to the Senate Rule 2-1.6, I hereby give notice that I will introduce a minority report to be read along with the majority report of Senate Bill 180, which Judiciary passed out, of, out on Thursday, February 22nd, 2024. Senator, Elena, Senator Parent um, of the 42nd. Okay. 
Mr. Secretary, pursuant to Senate Rule 2-1.6, I hereby give notice that I will introduce a minority report to be read along with the majority report of Senate Bill 517, which Judiciary passed out on Thursday, February 22nd, 2024. Senator Parent. Mr. President, the, Senator, the Senate Committee on Natural Resources and the Environment has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 542 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Anderson of the 24th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Public Safety has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 490 do pass, Senate Bill 554 do pass by substitute, Senate Bill 512 do pass by substitute, and Senate Resolution 616 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Albers of the 56th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Public Safety has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 510 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submit it, Senator Albers of the 56th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Regulated Industries and Utilities has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 505 do pass, Senate Bill 457 do pass, Senate Bill 437 do pass by substitute, Senate Bill 422 do pass by substitute, Senate Bill 336 do pass by substitute, Senate Bill 420 do pass by substitute, Senate Bill 444 do pass by substitute, and Senate Bill 502 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Cowsert of the 46th District Chairman. Ms. Dear, Sec Dear Mr. Secretary, pursuant to Senate Rule 2-1.6, I hereby give notice that I will introduce a minority report to be read along with the majority report of Senate Bill 502, which regulated industries passed out on Thursday, February 22nd, 2024. Senator Butler. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Retirement has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that House Bill 385 do pass by substitute. Respectfully submit it, Senator Williams of the 25th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Rules has had under consideration the following legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Resolution 221 do pass. Respectfully submit it, Senator Brass of the 28th District Chairman. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on State and Local Government has had under consideration the following le legislation and has instructed me to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation that Senate Bill 504 do pass, House Bill 1189 do pass. Respectfully submitted, Senator Ginn of the 47th District Chairman. That completes the order, Mr. President. Secretary will read bills and resolutions for the second time. Senate Bill 142 by Senator Anderson of the 24th and others. Dog ownership, the definition of dangerous dog, revised. Senate Bill 154 by Senator Dolezal of the 27th and others. Sale or distribution of harmful materials to minors. Provisions of code section 16-12-103 shall be applicable to libraries operated by schools, provide. Senate Bill 283 by Senator Strickland of the 17th and others. Pregnancy Protection Act, enact. Senate Bill 346 by Senator Anna Vitarte of the 31st and others. Department of Administrative Services, companies owned or operated by Iran to bid on or submit a proposal for state contract, prohibit. Senate Bill 347 by Senator Anna Vitarte of the 31st. Tallapoosa Judicial Circuit, additional judge of the Superior Courts, provide. Senate Bill 371 by Senator Strickland of the 17th and others. Daniel D. Potsiotli, Jr. Act, enact. Senate Bill 379 by Senator Harbin of the 16th and others. School Chaplains Act, enact. Senate Bill 383 by Senator Eccles of the 49th and others. Sale and use tax, special district mass transportation, requirements for intergovernmental agreements between counties, revised. Senate Bill 390 by Senator Walker of the 20th and others to amend titles 20, 36, 43, and 50 related to libraries, education, governmental entities, professions and businesses, acceptance and use of funds from the American Library Association prohibit under certain cir circumstances. Senate Bill 391 by Senator Williams of the 25th and others, health, local government and property, regulations and protections of cemeteries and burial grounds provide. Senate Bill 394 by Senator Dixon of the 45th and others, restricting explicit and adult designated educational resources in the act, in act. Senate Bill 403 by Senator Ginn of the 47th and others, ad valorem taxation of property, language required to be included in the notices of current assessment, revised. Senate Bill 423 by Senator Halpern of the 39th and others, education, maintenance, and placement of one or more automated external defibrillators in certain public schools, provide. Senate Bill 432 by Senator Harrell of the 40th and others, Quality Basic Education Act, provisions, recess for students in kindergarten and grades one through eight, require. 
Senate Bill 455 by Senator Strickland of the 17th and others, medical assistance, provisions to comply with federal law, revised. Senate Bill 456 by Senator Strickland of the 17th and others, central caregiver registry, disabled persons to the registry, add. Senate Bill 460 by Senator Dixon of the 45th and others, advanced practice registered nurses and physicians assistance, number that a physician can authorize and supervise at any one time, provide, revise. Senate Bill 465 by Senator Goodman of the 8th and others, homicide, the felony offense of aggravated involuntary manslaughter, provide. Senate Bill 466 by Senator Hatchett of the 50th and others, obscenity and related offenses, limitations of defense that sexually exploitive visual medium is digi digitally altered, provide. Senate Bill 474 by Senator Goodman of the 8th and others, unsolicited inquiries, notice of solicitation, including monetary offers, penalty, provide. Senate Bill 480 by Senator Hodges of the 3rd and others, Georgia Board of Healthcare Workforce, student loan repayment for mental health and substance use professionals serving in certain capacities, provide. Senate Bill 481 by Senator Hodges of the 3rd and others, Georgia Healthcare Professionals Data System, Establishment, Definitions, Collaboration with State Licensing Boards, provide. Senate Bill 491 by Senator Brass of the 28th and others, Licensed Pharmacist, Georgia State Board of Pharmacy to increase the maximum ratio of pharmacists authorized. Senate Bill 493 by Senator Hatchett of the 50th and others, Sexual Offender Risk Review Board, additional penalties for registered sexual offenders, provide. Senate Bill 495 by Senator Watson of the 11th and others, Low THC Oil Patient Registry, term of validity for a, of a registration card, provide. Senate Bill 497 by Senator Hickman of the 4th and others, uh, Education, High Demand Career Initiatives Program as the High Demand Apprenticeship Program, redesignate. Senate Bill 498 by Senator Jackson of the 41st and others, Georgia Interagency Council for the Homeless, create. Senate Bill 499 by Senator Ginn of the 47th and others, coordinated and comprehensive planning and service delivery by counties and municipalities, revise provisions. Senate Bill 501 by Senator Harbin of the 16th and others, Foundations of Law Act, enact. Senate Bill 507 by Senator Gooch of the 51st and others, special license plate, America the First, specialty license plate established. Senate Bill 508 by, by Senator Dixon of the 45th and others, administrative office of the courts, accessibility of certain per personal information of state and federal judges, justices, and spouses thereof provide. Senate Bill 515 by Senator Hatchett of the 50th and others, emergency medical services, two-year pilot program to provide additional ambulances to certain areas of the state provide. Senate Bill 524 by Senator Anna Vitarte of the 31st and others, health, the certification of community health workers provide. Senate Bill 532 by Senator Dixon of the 45th and others, education, sex education for public schools, in public school students in this state before fifth grade prohibit. House Bill 970 by Representative Dickey of the 145th and others, realizing educational achievement can happen scholarship, victims of human trafficking are eligible, provide. House Bill 985 by Representative Martin of the 49th and others, Georgia Higher Education Assistance Corporation, abolish. That completes the order, Mr. President. It is uh, now time for the morning roll call. Morning roll call. Are there any motions to excuse uh, Senator from the 33rd? 
Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, y'all. I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 38th for business outside the Capitol. Without objection, the senator from the 38th is excused. Any other motions to excuse? Secretary will call the roll. Senator, signify your presence by voting the yay switch. Secretary will unlock the machine. If I could get everybody's attention real quick, if I could have everybody's attention real quick. All senators, doorkeepers, will you please secure the doors? And if every senator could take their seat, I would greatly, I'd be greatly appreciated. Appreciative. Before we have our uh, morning devotion, I just wanted to uh, take a moment and allow this chamber to mourn the loss of a young lady over at the University of Georgia in Lincoln Riley, a young nursing student whose life was uh, tragically taken on February 22nd. Uh, I can't imagine what the family is going through right now. I can't imagine receiving that phone call as a father. And um, everything you heard about this young lady, she was... Uh, just a bright, personable, uh, wonderful uh, student, wonderful person, and, uh, and wonderful uh, addition to the University of Georgia family. And I just want to take this moment and, and ask that the uh, Senate stand and let's take a moment of silence uh, for this young lady whose life was taken way too soon. Amen. Thank you. It is now time for our morning devotion. All senators, please take your seats and cease all conversation. I would ask the doorkeeper to secure the chamber at this time. I'd like to recognize the senator from the 44th to introduce, introduce our chaplain of the day and lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance. Senator. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Would you please stand for the uh, our salute to the flag? Pledge of allegiance. Now to the Georgia flag. Good morning. It is my honor to present the chaplain of the day. The Reverend Dr. Terrence Jerome Gaddis is an author, educator, speaker, preacher, and pastor. A native of Jersey City, New Jersey, he holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science from Livingstone College, a Master of Divinity degree from the Emory University Canada School of Theology, and a doctor of ministry degree from the Morehouse School of Religion at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta. 
He is currently an associate professor of religion at Ohio Christian University, Mara, Georgia campus. Dr. Gaddy is the leading authority in co congregational development, helping pastors and church leaders transform their ministry into vibrant communities of faith. His book, Better Before Bigger, Practical Steps for Creating a Better and More Excellent Ministry, has become an acclaimed and sought after resource, and he has been an invited keynote presenter and trainer at churches and conferences across the country. Dr. Gaddis is also the author, author of The Bottom Line, Daily Devotions for the Work Week, a resource that enhances the work day by providing scriptures and reflections that encourage strength, peace, and faith. <sighs> Dr. Gaddis is a proud member of Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity and a graduate of the 2015 Class of Leadership Henry. He serves on the National Board of Directors for Forever Family, Inc., a nonprofit organization that serves and supports the children and families of those who are incarcerated, and he serves on the Board of Directors for the Henry County Department of Family and Children's Services. He was appointed as the first official chaplain for the city of Stockbridge in 2016 and was a recipient of the 2017 Chosen Award and the 2019 Pastor of the Year Award at the annual Gospel Choice Awards. In December, excuse me, in December 2019, Dr. Gaddis was called as the 16th pastor of the historic Mount Olive Baptist Church in Stockbridge, Georgia. During his pastorate, he has watched God's bless the congregation to grow and prosper in many areas, from the completion of the new, uh, the church's new worship center in tw November 2012, to the completion of the new Mount Olive Community Outreach Center in April 2014. Dr. Gaddis is married to the Reverend Dr. Elaine Gaddis, and together they have four children. Above all, Dr. Gaddis is an almost servant of God who loves the Lord, loves to serve God's people, and loves to proclaim the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Colleagues, please welcome Dr. Reverend Dr. Terrence Gaddis. Good morning. My words today are going to be wrapped in prayer. And so I would just ask you to pray with me. All wise and eternal God, we come to you this morning, thanking you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your loving kindness towards us. We come this morning lifting up your word as recorded in the Old Testament book of Second Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal, the, heal their land. Lord, we lean on this scripture this morning because it reminds us that when it comes to healing our land, there comes a time when thoughts and prayers are not enough. For your word says that in addition to praying, we must also turn from our wicked ways and that we must seek your face and not just what's in your hand. And even more than that, when it comes to healing our land, scripture says, that we must also humble ourselves. So we ask, Lord, that you bless those in this chamber, that they may humble themselves, that they may come together and reason together so that our children will no longer fall victim to gun violence, that they may come together and reason together so that our public schools will have the necessary resources to promote literacy and academic success, that they may come together and reason together so that the inequities in our healthcare system will be eliminated, that they may come together and reason together 
so that those who suffer from mental illness will have the help and the support that they need, that they may come together and reason together so that voters in Georgia will never be suppressed nor disenfranchised. It has been said that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. So we pray this morning that the members of this chamber will humble themselves and do something so that evil will not triumph in our great state. We pray that our legislators will come together this morning and do something so that our land will be healed and that our people will prosper. We pray these in all things in your holy name. Amen. I, uh, I saw Senator Vincent Ford. Oh, there he is. Oh, that Vincent Ford, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give our former colleagues and Senator Vincent Ford a round of applause. <laughs> Senator, there hadn't been one like you since. I'm telling you now. I miss you. I'm, there's been there's been plenty of pretenders. I can tell you that, but none. None quite as good as you are. So good to have you, Senator, and I hope you're doing well with everything. You look great. Good to have you here today. So I recognize him. I saw Senator Steve Henson. I recognized him earlier, but anyways, glad to have both y'all here today. We have uh, some very special guests with us today. A uh, group of gentlemen here with a little company called Hyundai Corporation here. I think y'all might have heard of them a little bit. They've got a, a uh, real uh, pride, uh, real, if you hadn't been down the, uh, to the Savannah area lately and seen the project that is going on right off uh, the interstate, it is a sight to be seen. It is a massive undertaking and uh, Hyundai has invested literally billions of dollars into the state of Georgia and we're glad to have them here in the state and uh, wish them nothing but the best but secretary read the resolution 
Senate Resolution 646 by Senators Watson of the First and others, a resolution commending Hyundai Motor, Com Motor Group's dedication to the state of Georgia and recognizing February 26, 2024 as Hyundai Day at the state capitol and for other purposes. Whereas Hyundai Motor Group will open its first fully dedicated electric vehicle and battery manufacturing facility in the state of Georgia, cementing Georgia's growing EV supply chain and ecosystem. Now therefore be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body commend Hyundai Motor Group and recognize February 26, 2024 as Hyundai Day at the State Capitol. That completes the order, Mr. President. Is there objection to the adoption of the resolution? Chair hears none. The resolution is adopted. I'd like to recognize a good senator from the first to uh, uh, introduce our guests. And we are, in all seriousness, we are very proud to have them uh, here in a, in a uh, big way in the state of Georgia. Uh, I think it's going to present a lot of opportunities. Uh, for that uh, South 95 corridor uh, that the good senator from the first represents. So, Senator, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. It is certainly an honor to have the Hyundai Motor Group here. It is Hyundai here at the Capitol, and uh, we're so happy. As you heard in the resolution, I'm going to just hit a couple of high points. The, uh, the dedicated electric vehicle facility and the battery manufacturing facility. But one of the things you don't hear about is the hydrogen-powered uh, uh, truck uh, that will be taking and bringing things from the port. Uh, so they're doing that in Korea now. Uh, they have a hydrogen powered uh, truck out here between the Capitol and CLOB. I'd love for you all to take a look at that. Uh, the economic benefit for that area uh, is phenomenal. Uh, you, This area of North Bryan County, which is my district, uh, is a little bit challenged and this area will bring up everyone in that area. As I've said before, Hyundai brings not only a very good income, uh, Mr. Uh, Munez said it's 25 percent higher than the average salary in that area, but they bring a 401k, they bring uh, a health plan, and they bring a really good deal on a vehicle uh, for people who work there. So it is a benefit not only for that area, which is uh, as big as, as Tybee Island, but it brings a uh, uh, growth for the whole area uh, that will have in the area will be about a 2.5 billion direct investment, more than 6,700 surrounding the area in that in that uh, just nor in the North Bryan County surrounding area. That's Chatham, Effingham, uh, Moore and Bryan, Liberty County, Evans County, Bullock County. Uh, uh, Emanuel County, Candler County, and so many others. So it is uh, my honor to introduce uh, Ho Jose Munez, who's the uh, President and Global Chief Operating Officer of Hyundai Motor Company. He's President CEO of Hyundai and Genesis Motor in North America. Uh, he uh, has, he has the capacity and responsible for driving the greater performance in key strategic regions, including Europe, India, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, Hyundai is based in U.S. headquarters in Fountain Valley, California. Mun uh, Mr. Munez uh, oversees the entire American market uh, for Hyundai, and uh, including North, Central, and South America. He's head of Hyundai Motor Americas. Uh, he sits on the Motor Company Board of Directors, board member of, of Motional, a joint venture between the automotive technology uh, companies. And uh, prior to joining uh, Hyundai, uh, Mr. Munez was the chief performance officer for Nissan, which grew that in, uh, in China and other areas. He is a native of Spain and earned his PhD in nuclear engineering. Uh, he has his MBA from Instituto de Empresa, which I'm sure I did not pronounce correctly, uh, in business school in Madrid, uh, completed executive management programs uh, in the UK and uh, the NSAID Business School in France. He's fluent in English, Spanish, and French. I'd like to introduce Mr. Jose Munez uh, to say a few words. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Wow, what a nice introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, so, Governor of First Lady Camp, Lieutenant Governor Jones, Chairman Watson, Commissioner Wilson, leaders from Bryan, Chatham, Effingham, and Bullock counties. Honorable members of the Georgia Senate, on behalf of Hyundai, it is my great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the resolution proclaiming today in the great state of Georgia as Hyundai Day. We are truly honored. We are so proud to call the Peach State home. Our new meta plant in Savannah will transform the lives of thousands of hardworking women and men in Georgia for decades to come. 
I've opened a lot of plants in a lot of countries. I've never seen anything like our new Meta plant. Hyundai Motor Group Meta Plant America is more than a production site. It is a campus for the future of mobility. Together with our partners, we are investing $12.6 billion in an assembly plant and two battery joint ventures. This operation will create tens of thousands of high paying American jobs for the people of Georgia and generate billions in economic impact every year. Today, I'm pleased to announce that because of the great support we have received from you all, our new Meta plant will start producing cars ahead of schedule. We are hiring and training talented and hardworking Georgians at a very fast clip in order to start production in the fourth quarter this year. Starting production in Q4 ensures we will open the entire campus by our target of Q1 2025. Thanks to the governor, Pat, and Trip, and the team in Savannah, we are several months ahead of the schedule. This reinforces what the world already knows, that Georgia is a great place to do business and is establishing itself as an EV production hub. You can tell your constituents that our investments in EVs are creating American jobs and incredible opportunities for the people of Georgia. Please have a look at some of our EVs outside as well as our hydrogen powered commercial vehicles. And let me know when you're ready for a test drive. Thank you again for the 100-day resolution and for your continued support. God bless you, God bless Georgia, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. We have uh, some more special guests here today. We've got one of our one of our famous North Georgia wineries, a vineyard there. That if uh, if you have not been to see this place, and the senator from the 51st district, I'm telling you, you're missing out on something. It is uh, it is a, a very very beautiful establishment, and uh, and the senator was gracious enough to host some. So a nice little event for me up there, and uh, I was duly impressed, Senator. Secretary, read the caption. 
Senate Resolution 511 by Senators Gooch of the 51st and others, a resolution recognizing March 2024 as Georgia Wine Month and for other purposes, whereas today the state's wine industry stands as a robust growth sector and economic contributor, generating more than $5 billion from vineyard-related activities in 2022. And in, in addition to its economic impact, the Georgia wine industry also has a broad environmental impact and contributes to the diversity of Georgia-grown products and the overall agricultural economy. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body recognized March 2024 as the Georgia Wine Month in honor of the wine industry's numerous beneficial impacts on the state. That completes the order, Mr. President. Is there objection to the adoption of the resolution? Chair hears none. The resolution is adopted. Good. We have multiple vineyards that are represented here today. I apologize for that. I was, I, uh, I didn't know y'all had more than one beautiful location, Senator, but y'all, y'all have multiple locations. So, uh, and uh, apparently we have a former state senator, uh, Zem Zem Zemper Zemaripa, Zemaripa. So, uh, is a former state senator from the 39th district, I believe. Is that correct? 36. 36. Okay. Not listening. Well. All right, well, uh, I recognize the senator from the 51st to introduce our special guest. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't think the senator from the 36th has caught on yet that her predecessor is up here on the rostrum behind me, and I think she's being called out, but uh, Senator Sam Zimaripa joins us not only as a former senator, but also as a vineyard owner in North Georgia and specifically in Dahlonega, Georgia. Today we're proud to have all of these vineyard operators and winery owners here to the state capitol along with some of the members of the Gilmer County Chambers of Commerce that's up in the gallery and over in the house. Uh, we recognize the Georgia wine industry today as a historic agricultural standhold, stronghold in Georgia which continues to positively benefit Georgians by naming March of each year as Georgia Wine and Grape Growers Month. Today, the state's wine industry stands as a strong and robust growth sector and economic contributor, generating over $5 billion from vineyard-related activities just in 2022 alone. The Georgia wine industry directly employed close to 21,000 workers and created approximately 7,500 other jobs just last year. Georgia's wineries serve as a major tourist attraction and it brought in nearly 300,000 visitors and contributed expenditures close to $84 million in the year 2022. Georgia wineries directly impact other industries such as transportation companies, musicians, Georgia artisans, and much more. In rural areas such as North Georgia, winery growth has led to the reclamation of large tracts of land to be used for domestic farming and productive use. In fact, there's over 100 wineries in Georgia today, over 100. In fact, there's 105 is the information I just received. The impact of Georgia wineries can be observed around the nation as Georgia wineries have become more and more recognized in national wine awards, including Best Wineries in America and the Dahlonega Plateau, which was designated as an American viticultural area just a couple years ago. Today, I'd like to introduce to the chamber a few winery owners from my home district in North Georgia and also the uh, District 50, which is also represented by the senator here to my left. With us today is Ms. Terry Darby, Ms. Jane Miller, Mr. Bill Cox, and Mr. Eric Miller. We've already recognized former Senator Sam Zamarepa, who lives in North Georgia as well, but at this time I'd like to turn the podium over to their spokesperson, Ms. Jane Miller, who owns the Yona Mountain Vineyard in Cleveland, Georgia. Thank you very much, Senator Gooch. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Jones. Georgia wine grape growing was once a large part of Georgia's agricultural face.
but it was destroyed, unfortunately, because of prohibition. However, during the late 1980s, several intrepid pioneers came back and began starting to start some wineries. Today, it's a bustling, fast-growing industry, agritourism industry, for our state. Georgia is almost the perfect region for growing wine grapes because our latitude is the same as from southern Italy to southern France. But unfortunately, we are competing against other states like Virginia and North Carolina for the customer's attention. A couple of numbers from the 2022 economic impact study. In, in 2022, there were over 250,000 tourism visits to Georgia State wineries. And Georgia State wineries generated over $410 million in taxes back to the state. We appreciate you all for honoring our industry, and we look forward to making Georgia an even greater state because of our efforts. Thank you very much. If I could uh, have everybody's attention, please. It is always a pleasure to have um, our federal representation come down to the Capitol and, uh, and get an opportunity to address uh, each chamber. I would like to, uh, for y'all to give uh, attention to our young senior senator of the state of Georgia. The, uh, are you the youngest in the... He is, he is the youngest in the uh, United States Senate, and, uh, he, but he's our senior senator. So, uh, but uh, we've got uh, Senator John Ossoff here. Uh, uh, senator Ossoff got to visit a little bit beforehand, had a good conversation. I complimented him on his staff, which does a great job uh, with their constituent service work. And, uh, and that's, a, uh, that's a good indicator of what kind of person he is when he has a responsive uh, staff and, and people who work in his office, uh, they, uh, and, and they care about doing the work of the, of the people. That's, a, that's always a good sign. Uh, and uh, at, at this time, I'd like to uh, give the senator an opportunity to uh, see you guys, address you guys, and, uh, and it's a pleasure to have you here today, Senator. Well, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, thank you for the privilege of addressing this chamber, and it's a pleasure to see so many of you. Good morning. Uh, I am grateful for this opportunity. Lieutenant Governor Jones, President Pro Tem Kennedy, Majority Leader Gooch, Minority Leader Butler, Caucus Chair, Parent, thank you for the chance to spend some time with you, to join you in this historic chamber. I'd like to begin by expressing on behalf of all Georgians, as I did in phone conversations over the weekend with Augusta University President Brooks Keel and UGA President Moorhead, our shock and outrage at this horrific murder of a young woman, Lakin Riley, in Athens, a nursing student with a bright future ahead of her. And I would like to ask that we just take a moment and rise and observe a moment of silence and solidarity with her family, her community, and those institutions.
Thank you. Of course, it's a, a great honor to be with you here in this chamber where elected representatives who are empowered by voters to make laws on behalf of the people gather to do so. That process of representative government is core to our republic and to our freedom, which are defended every day around the world by those who serve in uniform. So I hope you won't mind as well if I take the opportunity to ask all of those who serve and have served, please to rise and to be honored and thanked by those of us here in the chamber and in the gallery as well. Please, all those who have served in uniform and do serve. And I, and I hope, Lieutenant Governor, that I haven't committed some gross violation of Senate rules by inviting participation from those assembled in the gallery this morning. Look, I, I'm here to, to just convey to you this. I am here to work with you. I want you to succeed. I want your communities to succeed because when we all work together, Georgia succeeds. And the reality is that most of our constituents don't wake up every day defining themselves as Democrats or Republicans, and neither should we. And in fact, I think most Georgians and most Americans recognize that the level of division and hatred in our politics is tearing this country apart. And that's why I don't invest my time in controversy or notoriety, whether through my service on the Intelligence Committee or fighting for Georgia growers to gain greater access to world markets or working with all of you to implement the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is the greatest investment in American infrastructure since the Eisenhower administration. It's about building decent bipartisan working relationships and staying closely connected to our constituents. And I know that's what motivates each of you as well. And it's a pleasure to work with so many of you on both sides of the aisle to get things done for Georgia. It's been a pleasure, for example, to work with Senator Russ Goodman to advance the interests of Georgia's farmers and growers. It's been a pleasure to work with Senator Tanya Anderson, who's on my military academy board, to help identify those promising young candidates for opportunities to study at our service academies. And my legislative efforts and my service to the state will remain focused on being the maximally accessible and responsive public servant responsive and accessible to all of you who are the elected representatives of the people and responsive and accessible to the people. And I will also continue to sustain the oversight and investigations that are a crucial part of the U.S. Senate's role in our constitutional system. I see that Senator Kirkpatrick is here, and I want to thank her for her leadership on behalf of vulnerable foster children here in the state of Georgia. I know the safety of vulnerable children is a top priority for so many in this body, and in light of the dangerous conditions that prevail in foster care systems nationwide, including here in our own state, I hope that the urgency of reform will lead to meaningful legislative progress to protect Georgia's most vulnerable children. And I thank all of you who have been engaged in leading that effort. My team and I are standing by to address your needs. Many of you have my cell phone. If you don't, I'll make sure you do. Please call me and text me whenever and however I can be of service to your, you and your communities in the interest of the state of Georgia and in the interest of the United States. And thank you again, Lieutenant Governor, for the privilege of addressing you this morning. God bless.
We have a um, special guest, a, a retired, soon to be retired school teacher here. And we always like to honor our public educators. So, Secretary, read the caption. Senate Resolution 688 by Senators Merritt of the 9th and others, a resolution recognizing and commending Ms. Janita Shorter for her three decades of outstanding service in education and for other purposes. Whereas it is with immense honor and deep appreciation that we acknowledge Ms. Janita Shorter for her remarkable 30-year-long career as an inspiring life science educator, and Ms. Shorter's unwavering commitment to academic excellence has left an indelible mark on the lives of countless students. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body recognize and commend Ms. Janita Shorter for her three decades of tireless dedication to the noble profession of teaching, as well as extend best wishes for future health and happiness. That completes the order, Mr. President. Is there objection to the adoption of the resolution? Chair hears none. The resolution is adopted. Recognize the senator from the ninth to speak to the measure. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, members. Uh, I have the pleasure of. Uh, introducing Ms. Uh, Janita Shorter. Uh, I think we can all agree that having a great teacher can change the tra trajectory of someone's life and instill a lifelong love of learning. Most of us have had an edu educator at some point who saw something in us and encouraged us to achieve. One such, such teacher, Ms. Janita Shorter, has touched hundreds of thousands of lives throughout her decades of dedication to her students. Janita Shorter worked for nearly 20 years at J.P. McConnell Middle School as a life science teacher, where she went the extra mile in, inside and outside of the classroom. Her work uh, includes coaching a step team, mentoring over 600 students in the Jekyll Island 4-H Club, and serving as a co-graduate advisor with the Kappa Alpha, with the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. And she built valuable life skills and strong characters in the young people whose lives that she has touched. She has inspired many, including her son, who similarly dedicates himself to, and others as a doctor of emergency medicine, and her daughter with a similar love of science and learning, pursuing her PhD in biomedical research. Her generosity and dedication towards her students and community as a whole is why we, the members of this body, are honored to recognize and celebrate a truly amazing educator and mentor. And with that, let's welcome Janita Shorter. And she brought with her today her husband, Reggie Shorter. Good morning, Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones and esteemed members of the Georgia Senate. Thank you for having me here today. I want to express my heartfelt gra gratitude to Senator Nikki Merritt and her team for recognizing my contributions to Gwinnett County Public Schools. I also want to thank, thank my family, community, and former student, Ms. Nyla Cyan Williams for their unwavering support. As I transition to retirement, I am grateful for the opportunity to have served and positively impact the lives of my students. Once again, thank you for your leadership and commitment to our state. Are there any unanimous consents? Does any senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? Recognize the senator from the 32nd.
Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to remind all my colleagues that today is KSU Day at the Capitol. Kennesaw State University is growing and you've got a one pager on your desk highlighting several updates from KSU. To this year is the 60th anniversary of KSU and the 75th anniversary of Southern Poly and they were consolidated in 2015. KSU is one of the fastest growing universities in the state. Their fall enrollment is 45,000 students. They're Georgia's third largest university and has the largest population of in-state undergraduates in the state. They are continuing to meet the needs of Georgia's workforce, breaking ground on a state-of-the-art STEM building. And um, I didn't wear my yellow and black today, but hooty hoo. I yield the well, thank you. Recognize the senator from the 49th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, today I come to you as the mother of a sophomore daughter at the University of Georgia. Since the horrible tragedy took place in Athens on Thursday, I've thought about speeches, social media posts, and most of all, the conversations that I need to have with my daughter, Chloe. Drew and I have discussed what to say to her and what not to say to her. She texted me Thursday just before the news broke about the murder of Lake and Riley. She was experiencing a range of emotions. She was scared, anxious, and she was angry. My daughter shouldn't have to be dealing with this, but more importantly, Lake and Riley's family shouldn't be dealing with this. They should be celebrating her weekly and daily successes that we all desire to do as parents. We spent Friday night in Athens with Chloe and, and her sorority. It was dad's weekend and absolutely the most solemn experience we've ever had in the classic city. Clearly, Lakin's death was on everyone's mind and hindered what should have otherwise been a fun weekend. It stinks spending so much time telling your daughter the do's and don'ts of exercising alone, going out, or simply walking to class. The way I see it, this body and everyone serving underneath the Gold Dome has an obligation to keep the citizens of Georgia safe. Folks, we pass a lot of bills each year, and I wonder how many are truly dedicated to the safety and security of our citizens. We cannot lose sight of this. If that means dropping back and punting on some legislation, I'm all in. Resolutions in this chamber are what they are. They aren't law, but they do show what we stand for. A couple of weeks ago, we had the opportunity to show solidarity and show the country that Georgia wants borders closed to illegal immigration that Georgia doesn't put the safety and security of her citizens behind anyone. I'm proud to have signed and voted for this resolution. I couldn't have looked my daughter in the eye knowing I didn't have the political fortitude to vote for this. I suspect some of you would have voted with us if you had a crystal ball and could have seen the tragedy coming. Maybe not. The fact is, if this thug had not been in Athens, Georgia illegally, Miss Riley would still be here with us today. Listen clearly for the next minute or so. My family's been advocating for immigration reform for over 20 years. I get it, not everyone coming across that border is a murderer and I feel for them. My compassion is fading though. Our children, citizens of this great state, deserve better. Their safety and security is far more important to me than living conditions in other countries. This blame game is shameful, some of you want want to even blame Republicans in Congress. I say there are laws on the books enforce them. To quote former Governor Nathan Deal, while he was serving as my congressman, 
You have two choices, enforce the laws we have or make new ones. There's simply no choice but to inf enforce current law until the new laws are passed. To close, I ask how many of you want to live looking over your shoulder? Does anyone in this chamber truly desire a brighter future for illegal, illegal immigrants than your own blood? It's not selfish to stand up for your child, it's common sense. Some of you won't say it out loud, but deep down you know it's true. Our kids and citizens deserve better. It's time to stop playing games. Mr. President, I yield the will. Thank you, Senator. Recognize Senator from the 35th. Thank you, Mr. President. We have our special guest coming in right now, I hope. Come on. Here they come. Wow. Mr. President, senators, I am so, I'm elated to be the one to make this presentation this morning. Charlene Hunter Gall was born February 27th in 42. American newspaper reporter and broadcast journalist who covered current events, geopolitics, and issues of race. In 1961, Hunter became the first African American woman to enroll in the University of Georgia. She was also among the first African American women to graduate from the university, earning a degree in journalism in 1963. After completing college, Hunter moved to New York City where she worked for the New Yorker magazine from 63 to 67 in an administrative job and contributed pieces to the talk of the town section. Many of her articles express rich and realistic portrayals of life in Harlem. She next joined the New York Times as a staff reporter in 1968 through 77, eventually becoming the newspaper's Harlem Bureau Chief. In addition to winning numerous awards for her coverage of inner city issues, Hunter Galt brought about a significant change in the Times editorial policy, eventually convincing the editors to drop their use of the word Negroes when referring to African Americans. Hunter Galt gained a national audience after she joined the Public Broadcasting Service, PBS, news program, McNeil Lerier Le Report in 78. When the program grew into the 60 Minutes, she became a national correspondent and reported on topics including racism, Vietnam veterans, life under apartheid, drug abuse, human rights issues, and the list goes on. In 1997, Hunter Galt became PBS, left PBS, excuse me, to become the African Bureau Chief for National Public Radio. And in 1999, she was named Johannesburg Bureau Chief for the Cable News Network. CNN, a post that she's, she held until 2005. She published a memoir, In My Place, and New News Out of Africa, a book documenting positive developments in Africa. I don't know about you, but I think most of us in this room stand on her shoulders. Where are you? 
Come, come out and let everybody see you. Let's go up here. Can we, somebody walk up here? I'm sorry, I have uh, knee replacements, so I couldn't get up to walk with you. But I'm so truly, truly honored. Mr. Uh, Lieutenant Governor knows all about our, uh, your efforts and all the things that you've done for us, especially being the first African American to uh, go to the University of Georgia and to finish. So Black Caucus members, come over here. This oh. is our great <laughs> black, black oh. history. All right, Senator, Black that's history wonderful, Black history for this whole year. I'm so excited. Thank you for being here. Thank you, husband and son and, and everybody. All and right. Nisha, thank you for me, <laughs> Rep Representative. All right. Okay, thank, I got thank everybody. You, that, thank, yeah. thank you, and then Senator. I would like for them to take a picture with you. I'm sorry. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Just come on up here after okay. I get done with that one. All right. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Senator. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Very nice to have you here today. Very nice to have you. All right, we've got a, gone a little bit out of order, but we're going to introduce our doctor of the day. From um, we, uh, she had to run over to the house for a medical emergency, so that shows you how important it is to have a physicians uh, volunteering their time here today. And uh, we are so happy to have her all the way from Statesboro, Georgia. And I'd like to recognize the senator from the fourth to introduce our doctor of the day. Thank you, Mr. President. It is my honor to introduce not only my friend, but my neighbor, Dr. Michelle Zenum. Michelle attended Mercer University uh, School of Medicine and then completed her residency in general pediatrics from University of Florida. In 2016, she left a successful career of primary care to focus exclusively on behavioral pediatrics. Her practice serves children from 80 Georgia counties. It focuses on autism, spectrum disorder, complex ADHD, anxiety disorders, Tourette's, and related disorders. Also in 2018, Dr. Uh, Michelle Zena, from her heart, started, started a nonprofit that many of y'all need to consider donating to. Joanne and I did this past year because of our love for uh, what uh, Dr. Zena is doing. And the name of it is Behavioral Pediatrics Resource Center, Inc. And it provides training and educational resources. It serves families, teachers, defects, law enforcement, and other groups who work with children diagnosed with autism, ADHD, or anxiety. I would like to now introduce you to Dr. Michelle Zena. All right. Thank you, sir. I, I can say that I, I do understand exactly how busy all of y'all are um, because I often feel like a, a chicken running around with my head cut off and then I come to the Capitol and it's not a break from work, it's just like work. Um, and and y'all do it every day and you're not well paid, um, but, your, but your constituents certainly appreciate that. And I have um, patients that are constituents of almost half of you uh, because there are so few people um, who provide medical diagnosis and treatment for autism spectrum disorder in Georgia. Um, the Behavioral Pediatrics Resource Center really works hard to empower all of the adults in children's lives um, that are not necessarily aware of what their needs are and to turn that around. And we've been uh, working closely with DFACS, um, educators, Department of Juvenile Justice, and other state agencies um, to improve the quality of life of children. So y'all do that every day, and I appreciate that when I send a constituent to ask their senator for help, um, things usually turn out just right. All right, thank you, Dr. Zimmerman. Appreciate you being here today. I uh, recognize the senator from the 33rd, and let me remind you, Senator, we got three minutes on point of personal privilege. And I remind everybody else who has uh, signed up to have a point of personal privilege. While we're waiting on the senator from 33rd, I want to introduce our new senator from the 29th right here. He's from Columbus, Georgia. He got a fresh shave. He looks about 20 years younger. Y'all welcome him to the chamber here. Thank you, Mr. President fellow senators, colleagues, friends, and the rest of y'all. 
Uh, today we're recognizing and, com and commending the Georgia Cancer Control Consortium as part of the Georgia Department of Public Health, HPV Cancer Free Georgia, Cancer Pathway, and the Susan Jolly Awareness Program for their exceptional contributions to cervical cancer education and awareness in Georgia. Whereas January was designated as the month for Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, whereas Georgia Center Control Consortium HPV Cancer Free Georgia Cancer Pathways and the Susan Jolly Awareness Program are dedicated to HPV and cervical cancer awareness. Whereas it is estimated over 4,000 deaths from this disease will occur in the United States annually, similar to the incident rates, the death rates in the United States dropped by around 50% in the mid-1970s, partly because of the increase in screening resulted in earlier detection of cervical cancer. Whereas cervical cancer is most often diagnosed between the ages of 35 and 44, the average age of diagnosis in the United States is 50. Over 20% of the cervical cancer in diagnosed are diagnosed after the age 80, 65. Whereas the efforts of the Georgia Cancer Control Consortium, HPV Cancer Free, Georgia Cancer Pathways, the Susan Jolly Awareness Program have helped increase public awareness of can cervical cancer and have also educated the public to HPV prevention and HPV vaccine. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body recognize and commend the 2024 HPV champions <coughs> as well as the Georgia Cancer Control Consortium, <coughs> HPV Cancer Free Georgia, Cancer Pathways, and the Susan Jolly Awareness Program for their exceptional effort and commitment to advancing cervical cancer awareness and eliminating disease. Let's have a round of applause. We have Ms. Triana Arnold here who represents the organization. Thank you so much. I yield the well in less than three minutes, sir. Recognize Senator from the 24th. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to come to the well today to wish to a lady back home that puts up with me every day a happy birthday. Today is my wife's birthday, the love of my life. Happy birthday, dear. Senator, did I hear you say it's your wife's birthday? God bless her. She puts up with a lot. She's a good lady. She's a good lady. So tell her, wish her a happy birthday for us. Recognize Senator from the 56. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to remember my constituent, Blake and Riley. I've been communicating with their parents, Allison and John. No parent should ever have to outlive their child. They are obviously heartbroken. And they want to make it their life mission to make sure that her loss is not forgotten and people are protected. Make no mistake, this could have been prevented. Three and a half years ago, a decision was made to not enforce Title 42 anymore in our border. A decision was made to stop building the border wall. 
a decision was made that caused four times the surge of illegal aliens crossing that border on a daily basis. A decision was made not to deport almost half the people that were being deported prior. And since that time, we've had criminals, we've had terrorists, we've had fentanyl crossing that border. And not only did this person come in, but he was arrested before, up in New York. This is unconscionable. And this is an executive action from Washington, D.C., and they have blood on their hands. It's time that people stopped making excuses and did their job. I hope we'll all forever remember this young lady when her light was blown out by an awful human being who was in this country illegally and had been arrested prior. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. <coughs> Thank you, Senator. I recognize Senator from 39th. Thank you. I rise today to recognize the achievements and enduring legacy of the African American Mothers Organization, Jack and Jill, particularly spotlighting the vibrant Southeastern region's contributions, whose members are here at the Capitol today. Founded with the mission to nurture future African American leaders, Jack and Jill has been at the forefront of community service, leadership development, and cultural enrichment for our youth since 1938. As a current and active Jack and Jill mom, I've witnessed firsthand the transformative power of our collective efforts. In the southeastern region, we've led by example, hosting engaging educational programs, impactful community service projects, and fostering environments where our children thrive in their cultural identity, develop a strong sense of social responsibility, and become leaders who excel in their respective fields. As we look to the future, we will continue to build on this legacy with renewed vision. Thank you again to every member, parent, and child of the Southeastern region for your dedication to excellence. Your passion and hard work are the heartbeat of Jack and Jill of America. And as we move forward, let us remain united in our mission, steadfast in our purpose, and unwavering in our commitment to make a difference in the lives of our children and our communities. Thank you. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. I recognize the Senator from the 8th to speak on point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. We all know how great of a relationship the United States and Britain, the United Kingdom, has had uh, over these many years. It's my honor today uh, to recognize a true friend of uh, President Jimmy Carter and the United States. Uh, the Right Honorable Sir Simon Burns was a conservative member of the British Parliament from 1987 until his retirement in 2017. Um, while in Parliament, he served in, in the government under Prime Ministers Margaret Thatcher, John Major, and David Cameron, and was twice Minister of Health and Minister of Transport. He's thrilled to be here with our Georgia friends. He loves the United States and has stood with us shoulder to shoulder, shoulder during some of our darkest hours, including 9-11. His dad actually fought alongside uh, American troops in Burma against the Japanese during World War II. He's a second cousin to famed British musician David Bowie. Uh, Sir Simon, uh, we thank you. We thank you for you, the friendship and the friendship bet between our countries and uh, glad to have a cousin from across the pond over here. Thank you, Mr. President, I yield the well. Recognize the senator from the 14th. Thank you, Mr. President. I unfortunately missed him in the hallways earlier, but we are always pleased each year to have as guests to the Capitol Hemophilia of Georgia, a Sandy Springs-based agency that is the only agency of its type in the state. 
uh, that works with uh, bleeding disorders, specifically hemophilia, von Willebrand disease, and other bleeding disorders. <clears throat> but it's a very important service uh, for this community that's got a lot of, uh, of special challenges. Uh, they provide comprehensive health care, education, and advocacy. Uh, and I'll be filing a resolution today, uh, as we always do, to honor their efforts. So just your annual reminder uh, that they are there in Sandy Springs. They are doing great work for this community. We're really proud of them. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. I recognize Senator from the 16th. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate it. I uh, want to uh, do a resolution today. We've done a resolution recognizing the Association of Georgia's General Aviation Airports. There are 95 General Aviation Airports across Georgia that uh, are essential to the transportation and economic infrastructure. They also are what open up all of Georgia and allow you to go to places uh, where blueberries are picked and, and where peaches are grown and get businesses in and out that are having an, an interest in our state. These local airports support the uh, aviation industry in our state, is the backbone of much of our economy, and the aviation airports have an economic impact of over $2 billion uh, to the state's economy. Uh, with us this morning are two of their representatives, Hope Macaluso, Mitch Ellerby, and Amber McCall over here on the wall with their hands. And uh, if you would welcome them, and uh, thank you for all you do to keep our airports running, and we thank you very much. Recognize Senator from the six. Good afternoon, colleagues. I am here to recognize an organization that's been uh, contributing to Georgia, contributing to the Latino community here uh, in Georgia for several years now. Uh, the organization is for their Latinx and they are a national civic and social justice nonprofit advocating on behalf of the Latino community. And uh, they were established to advance economic, environmental, and immigrant justice uh, for the Latino community and have been leading all kinds of efforts, including voter registration drives and issue-based advocacy uh, throughout the year. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge them because they are here today uh, training volunteers and advocates right here at the Capitol uh, to advocate on, on behalf of these issues. Uh, and they've done great work on behalf of my community. So colleagues, please join me in, in um, welcoming uh, representatives from the organization who are here in the chamber with us uh, for their Latinx. Welcome. And with that, I yield the well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, and thank you. Appreciate those fine young folks over there for all their hard work that they do. Recognize the Senator from the 55th for a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I rise to discuss the tragic death of Lincoln Raleigh and the appalling response to her death we've seen across the state. Lincoln Raleigh was a 22-year-old nursing student in Athens, Georgia. Last week, an undocumented immigrant allegedly killed Lincoln when she was out for an afternoon jog. Like we've seen so many times this session and this weekend, the majority saw her death as an opportunity to promote and defend Donald Trump. Georgia's Republicans rushed to blame President Biden for this murderer's presence in Athens. Just a few weeks ago, my good friend and colleague from the 42nd District 
offered to amend a resolution on the important issue of border security. That m amendment would have urged Congress to do their constitutional duty and pass a bill that would have made it harder for undocumented persons to enter the United States. Emergency authority for border shutdowns, tougher asylum standards, over 1,500 new border patrol agents, 1,200 new ICE agents, $7.6 billion in ICE funding, with $3.2 billion to expand detention capacity would have been a part of that emergency authority. That $3.2 billion would have helped detain people like Lake and Riley's murderer, by the way. That's President Biden's border security record. Donald Trump demanded Republicans stop the deal so that his political fortunes wouldn't suffer. So much for America first. Our brother, our border crisis continue because Donald Trump has convinced one party that the only thing that matters is putting Donald Trump first, no matter the cost. I pray for the Riley family. I pray that God's divine grace will guide them through the awful process of grieving a lost child. I can't begin to imagine the pain. Mr. President, I yield the well. Senator from, Senator from, yeah. Senator from 27. As a follow-up to the previous speaker, I guess I would just start this by saying now is the time for the rest of the story. I've been in business for about 18 years now with a guy named Matt Brahms. Matt's got a son named Graydon, who I've known since he was a baby. Graydon was recently engaged to be married. And Matt sent me a text yesterday to let me know that his son's fiance's best friend was a young lady by the name of Lake and Riley. And Matt talked about the debate that we had in this well last week before last as it related to border security. I'm just going to read you what Matt had to say. He said, I watched your speech that you, guys, that you made prior to this tragic event. It's an amazing how this falls on deaf ears and a level of intellectual dishonesty. It requires the horrific death of a sweet, young, promising lady. And even that, they'll probably ignore. On top of being deeply saddened, we're livid. And I guess I would just ask the question, colleagues, are we livid? Are you livid? Did her life matter? Will we say her name? We have linked arms in this chamber in the midst of tragedy in the past. And I wonder if we're able to do it today. And the minority leader really just kind of talked about why we pin this at the feet of President Biden. Unless there's any question why we pin this at the feet of President Biden, it's because on day one of his administration, he relaxed the immigration laws in this country. He ended catch and release. He refunded sanctuary cities. He got rid of Title 42. He signaled to the world that America is open for the biggest abuse of the asylum laws in this country, and the, the likes of which we have never seen. Eight million people have crossed the border. Most of them have been let go into areas of this country. We don't even know where they are. We were lectured during the debate and, and given the left-wing talking point that no human is illegal. 
Was Lakin's murderer illegal? We talk about we need more laws, we need more this, we need more that. No, we don't. We need to exist, we need to enforce the laws that are on the books today. Her murderer was in this country illegally. He was arrested and he was let go. So colleagues, will we link arms on this? Or will we hide under the desks in this chamber and in chambers all over this country because we're afraid what it might admit about what the Biden administration has done to the immigration laws in this country? Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Thanks, Senator. Does any other senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? Recognize Senator from the seventh. Thank you, Mr. President. The death of Lake and Riley is a tragedy. She is remembered by her family and friends as being kind and caring an extraordinary person whose life ended far too soon. My hope is that her killer is brought to justice for cutting short a remarkable young life. In moments like these, when horrible injustices are committed, we rush to demonize the people we believe are responsible. In this instance, immigrants have been characterized as criminals and thugs. And as a proud child of immigrants and the product of immigrant communities, I reject that kind of xenophobia with every fiber of my being. One in 10 Georgians was born outside the United States, and immigrants are not members of a violent invading horde. They are friends, neighbors, and colleagues. Immigrants commit far fewer crimes than American-born citizens. They are as invaluable to the future and prosperity of Georgia as everyone in this room. As Georgia mo mourns the loss of Lake and Riley, we must not succumb to tribalism and bigotry. I've heard many colleagues say that Georgia has sanctuary cities. However, Republicans outlawed them in 2009. And in fact, Georgia has the third largest detained immigrant population in the entire country. The Georgia Assembly has passed numerous anti-immigrant laws. We must focus on solutions, and this starts with fixing our broken immigration system. Years of inaction in Washington have created conditions that have overwhelmed our immigration resources while failing to respond to the needs of our country. A bipartisan group of U.S. Senators has crafted a plan to address many of these challenges. The plan is far from perfect. I believe it needs more work to ensure we protect the human dignity of every person reaching our shores. But it is, it is a starting point, and we need to have these tough conversations if we want to address the problems in the system. That said, the Republicans on Capitol Hill are refusing to even have a vote on this bill, a bill they demanded be negotiated for months. And because Donald Trump said acting on Im immigration would hurt his chances of being elected. Now is not the time for politics. It is a time to get things done. And I ask my Republican colleagues to press their representatives in Congress to act on immigration with the same zeal and determin determination we're seeing here today. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield. Does any other senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? Senator from the night, your light is on. Senator from the night. Thank you, Mr. President. As the mother of a young woman, I, like everyone here today, I, we gather with a heavy heart to mourn the tra tragic loss of Lake and Riley, a promising young woman whose life was cut short by senseless violence. And our deepest condolences go out again to her family and loved ones. But I wanna draw a different perspective to this conversation or this debate that we're having. The issue at hand is about violence against women, not illegal immigration. Statistics show that the majority of violent crimes against women are committed by US citizens, not undocumented Im immigrants. In fact, Latin-born immigrants are 45% less likely to commit a violent crime than a white American-born citizen. This is about basic human 
decency, not legal status. To apply our very justified fear and hatred of one who unjustly took the life of one among us to everyone who came over here from the same places would be just be wrong. It only divides us further and perpetuates a fear and hatred. We must address the underlying issue of morality and respect for life. Why have we not evolved as a society to value life above all else? As a community, we must find non-incendiary solutions to keep each other and our daughters safe. This means investing in resources towards public safety. So, towards public safety. These investments are essential for creating a safer environment for us all. In the memory of Lake and Riley and all women who lost their lives to violence, let's commit to creating a world where every woman can live free from fear. And together, we must do better. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the well. Does any other senator wish to rise on a point of personal privilege? You have before you a consent calendar of privilege resolutions. Does any senator wish to remove a resolution from the consent calendar? Is there objection to the adoption of resolution on the consent calendar? Chair hears none. The resolution on the consent calendar are adopted. Are there any withdraw? Are there any motions to withdraw? Recommit. You have before you a consent calendar of local bills. Mr. Secretary, have any objections been filed for any of the bills on the local consent calendar? Mr. President, no objections have been filed. Is there objections to agreeing to the Board of Committee on State and Local Government Operations, which is favorable to the passage of the bills on the local consent calendar? The chair hears none. The Board of the Committee is agreed to. The question is on the passage of the bills on the local consent calendar. All those in favor of vote yay, opposed nay. Secretary Lamp Machines. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 54, the nays are zero in this local consent calendar. Having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. I recognize the majority leader for a motion. Good morning. I move that Senate Bill 368 be engrossed at this time. Majority leader moves that SB 368 be engrossed. Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 368 by Senators Williams of the 25th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 5 of Title 21 of the OCGA relating to government transparency and campaign finance, so as to prohibit foreign nationals from contributing to candidates or campaign committees, to prohibit candidates and campaign committees from accepting contributions from foreign nationals and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Senator, you wish to speak on the motion? Is there objection to the Senator's motion? There is objection from the Senator from the 22nd. All those in favor of the Majority Leader's motion will vote yay. All opposed, nay. Secretary unlock the machine.
On the motion, the yeas are 34, the nays are 20. This motion has prevailed, and so therefore SB 368 is engrossed. All right, we're going to start on the rules calendar now. Uh, it is right now almost 1 o'clock. We're going to try to knock out a handful of these bills, probably the first four or five, and then we will break for lunch. And I think there is lunch downstairs. You'll have to ask your respected leaders where that lunch is. I'm not sure. Senator from the 26th, for what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, I'd like to make a motion that Senate Bill 235 be laid on the table. Hold on, Senator, your motion is out of order, but it will it will be in order momentarily. So SB 235, Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 235 by Senators Halpern of the 30, 39th and others, a bill to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 8 of Title 50 of the OCGA relating to the Department of Community Affairs so as to create the HBCU Innovation and Economic Prosperity Planning Districts Commission and for other purposes. The Committee on Economic Development and Tourism recommends this bill do pass by substitute. Respectfully submitted, Senator Beach of the 21st District Chairman. The Senate Committee on Economic Development and Tourism offers the following substitute to Senate Bill 235 to amend Article 2 of Chapter 3 of Title 20 of the OCGA relating to the Board of Regents and the university system so as to create the HBCU Innovation and Economic Prosperity Planning Districts Commission and for other purposes. That completes the order, Mr. President. Senator, from 26, your, your previous request is now, the timing for it is right. Mr. President, I ask that Senate Bill 235 be laid on the table. We have a motion, we have an objection. Uh, Senator from the 39th, would you like to speak on behalf of, your, of the bill? Take that back. We have a motion. We have an objection, uh, and it is it is not debatable. So, those in favor of the motion from the Senator 26 will vote yay. Those opposed, I mean, will vote yay. Those opposed, nay. Secretary, unlock the machine. On the motion, the yeas are 14, the nays are 40, and this motion has failed. I now recognize the senator from the 39th to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President and Senate colleagues. I am thrilled to bring to the floor Senate Bill 235, the HBCU Innovation and Economic Prosperity Planning Districts Act, legislation that was a recommendation from the bipartisan 
2022 Excellence, Innovation, and Technology at Georgia's Historically Black Colleges and Universities Study Committee. After months of hearings with business, nonprofit, education, economic development, public policy leaders, and of course, Georgia's own HBCU University presidents, the idea for this piece of legislation was sparked. More on that in just a moment. But first, let me take a step back and not assume that all of you know about these institutions of higher education. Georgia is home to 10 historically black colleges and universities, making us the number two state in the nation, tied with North Carolina, for having the most HBCUs. Three are public institutions, Savannah State University, Albany State University, and Fort Valley State University. Seven are private, Payne College in Augusta, and the remaining six, including Spelman College, Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse College, Morehouse School of Medicine, Morris Brown, and the Interdenominational Theological Center are just miles down the street from this capital in what is affectionately known as the Atlanta University Center, which is the oldest and largest consortium of African-American higher education institutions in the country. All 10 of these schools have positively impacted the lives of thousands upon thousands, nearly 20,000 students altogether each year, generation after generation, playing a vital role in elevating their socioeconomic status and helping to develop future business, civic, community, and faith leaders. So whether it's the first generation college student like both of my parents were when they left Mississippi farm life for a world of new opportunities, or one of the 76% of HBCU students who are Pell Grant recipients, or those second or third generation students who are carrying the weight of family expectations, HBCUs are proven pathways to the middle class or more. 70% of black, all black doctors and dentists 40% of all black engineers, 80% of all black judges, 50% of all black teachers in this country attended an HBCU. Here in Georgia, they award 23% of all bachelor degrees earned by black students and educate 18% of all black undergraduates each year at four-year institutions. Each graduating class together represents $9 billion in lifetime earnings. And these institutions are an enormous asset to our state, boasting a $1.3 billion economic impact to our state each year. Did you know that the number one university in Georgia for social mobility also happens to be the number one ranked public HBCU in the state, boasting one of the largest solar farms on a higher education campus in the entire nation. It's our other land grant institution, Fort Valley State University. The number one producer of African American marine science graduates in the country and the oldest public HBCU in our state at 134 years old, that's Savannah State University the number one producer of nursing associate degrees and registered nursing associate degrees in the state of Georgia, and the only HBCU in the state with a dental hygiene program, that's Albany State. The number one producer of black women with PhDs in STEM in the country, and the number one ranked HBCU in the country for 17 straight years also holds the spot for the number ninth most innovative school in the country. That's Spelman College, right here in Georgia. The number two ranked and the oldest school of social work in the state and the only HBCU in the nation with a cyber physical systems degree, think cybersecurity, AI, data analytics and robotics, well that's Clark Atlanta University here in Georgia the number one medical school in the nation for fulfilling the social mission of medical education with 61% of graduates staying in Georgia upon graduation, that's Morehouse School of Medicine here in Georgia. The number one producer of black men who go on to earn doctorates also happens to be the largest men's liberal arts college in the country and the only HBCU in the country dedicated to educating men. 
That's Morehouse College, right here in Georgia. I could go on. Georgia has much to celebrate, and I'm so glad to see HBCU University leadership, representatives, and other stakeholders who care about the growth and sustainability of these schools here in the Senate Gallery and in the Capitol today. There is no doubt that our HBCUs continue to be an important piece of the puzzle if we are to have a skilled, trained, diverse workforce that can meet the demands of business and emerging industries today and into the future. And yet, despite their monumental contributions, our HBCUs face considerable challenges, from the need for modern infrastructure to being under-resourced that hampers their growth and the development of their surrounding communities, every single one of them even the privates, and every HBCU in our state sits in underinvested neighborhoods and communities. SB 235 is a response to these challenges. The idea for this piece of legislation was sparked during testimony to the study committee uh, by a Georgia HBCU graduate and black thought leader who runs a not-for-profit, and then further solidified working with the Partnership for Southern Equity and others like the Southern Education Foundation, the United Negro College Fund, and the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, who joined the Lieutenant Governor, our President Pro Tem, and me on a visit to Fort Valley State University last fall. SB 235 creates HBCU Innovation and Economic Prosperity Planning Districts, which will serve as catalysts for diversifying our workforce driving innovation and economic impact, and anchoring community and economic development around their campuses, with our HBCUs at the center driving those efforts. The commission established under SB 235 has the authority to create five distinct planning districts, each tailored to the unique needs of its HBCU and community. Local advisory committees to include HBCU presidents or their designees and local community stakeholders would collaborate to establish a master plan driven by the priorities of the university. This structure is intentionally high level and deliberatively inclusive, leveraging the best and the brightest of our state to come together on the planning commission and the local advisory committees to spark a change that delivers for business, community, students, and the school. Federal, state, county, city, corporate, fun, fil, corporate or philanthropic funding can then be leveraged to support innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship at HBCUs on and off the campus. The transformative potential of these districts include developing mixed-use housing to diversify revenue and provide affordable housing options. This is something that we know at Albany State is an issue as they had 800 students on a housing wait list this year. Upgrading digital infrastructure to enhance, enhance internet access. This too is an issue. Even just down the street in the middle of Atlanta at the Atlanta University Center, there is no 5G or broadband on those campuses. They need the technology upgrades. The potential of these districts can support small business development, small business incubators, innovation hubs through the HBCU-led incubator, making environmental upgrades to improve local living conditions, facilitating public-private partnerships for campus improvements, establishing workforce development centers to train residents for emerging industries. This bill has a lot of potential, but let me tell you also what it doesn't do. SB 235 does not impact academic instruction or institutional autonomy. No president who came before the study committee stated such a concern. SB 235 does not create another higher education system. It creates a commission to assist in securing resources for investment in HBCUs. SB 235 does not threaten the existence of HBCUs, but instead offers a pathway to direct much needed investments to both the institutions and the surrounding communities. 
SB 235 only serves the interests of the HBCUs and the communities that they serve. Again, this idea emerged from black thought leaders who want these institutions to thrive. Right now today, there are substantial federal funds available for HBCUs, and these HBCU districts will unlock these resources and more, propelling these schools and their communities towards a future marked by innovation and prosperity. More than anything, this bill recognizes that HBCUs can be provided with the monetary and legislative resources necessary to play a more vital role not only providing academic instruction, but also further creating new opportunities for community connection. And there's a packet of support letters on your desk, too, in fact, from regional chambers to black-led nonprofits who all agree. Because we are Georgia and economic development is our core, we understand that there's a symbiotic relationship between our HBCUs, the communities they sit, and the future of this state. Because we understand that talent, especially diverse skilled talent, is a commodity that business is chasing and HBCUs contribute to our ability to deliver. Because we understand that Georgia is willing to see an opportunity and address it creatively. With your favorable support, we are at the precipice of something transformational and able to lead the nation in this effort. I ask you to please vote yes to SB 235. Mr. President, I will yield the well unless there are any questions. You have no questions, Senator. Thank you. That vote's gonna go a lot like that motion vote did too, Senator. Good job, good job. I recognize the senator from the 31st. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon. Um, just want to speak on behalf of the Senate bill authored by the senator from the 39th and just say it's a pleasure to stand before you today discuss this pivotal piece of legislation that holds tremendous promise for our state. I am proud to be a co-sponsor of this bipartisan effort aimed at driving innovation, economic development, and prosperity in Georgia. This legislation marks a significant step forward in our collective efforts in the next generation and foster economic growth in our communities. HBCUs have been long since the centers of excellence providing education and opportunity for generations of students. Yet we believe they have the potential to even be more vibrant hubs of research, technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation. With our state harnessing the 10 exceptional historic, historically black colleges, the potential for tremendous growth in and around their campus has never been greater. I want to emphasize that this legislation transcends political divides. It embodies the spirit of bipartisanship, cooperation, and underscores our shared commitment it is a blueprint for progress that recognizes the transformative power of innovation, collaboration, and education. I urge all of you to join me in supporting this innovative approach. Together, we can build stronger communities, expand economic opportunity, and leave a legacy of growth and sustainability for these higher education institutions for many generations to come. And with that, Mr. President, I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Recognize Senator from 26. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, I disagree with my colleague. Everything she said about HBCUs are true. My daddy, Fort Valley State graduate, Mr. Basketball. My mother, Albany State women basketball, Miss Albany State. My wife, 
cum laude Savannah State. Me, Tuskegee Institute, now university. Oh, laude. Let me just say why I disagree with this. Savannah State, run by the regents of Georgia. The president is chosen by the regents of Georgia. They used to have what they call advisory committees that made up a group of folks who determined who the president would be at the black institutions. That is no longer happening. They are chosen by the regents themselves. If you want to improve state HBCU, why not put a school, a marine biology at Savannah State that sits on the ocean? If you want to improve HBCU, why not put a school of veterinary medicine at Fort Valley State for large animals? If you want to prove Albany State, why not put a law school in the middle of the state of Georgia? That is on the regents. So my argument goes to the regents to do these things which will enhance those schools. Students go to schools depending on what the offering is in those schools. What you have here, and maybe it might be good for the private HBCUs, but you are setting up districts that folks will determine what might happen, and then they go to the president. Well, the president operates under the regents. We're gonna do what the regents tell him to do and run that school, or he will not have he or she will not have a job. So here again, we are what I call usurping. or what I call other resegregation. We fought to try to make schools sure that those HBCUs that were under state control moved ahead with programmatic programs that would increase the student body. So now you will add people who will determine what these particular institutions would look like because they're gonna take it to the president and if the president don't agree with them, they're gonna get mad and then the next thing you know, they're gonna be after the president. That's how it happens. We're in the legislative nature and we make political decisions all the time. Therefore, I said for the eight HBCUs, the state HBCUs, this is unnecessary. If you want to get some things changed, go to the regions. They are the ones that control these three institutions. And the president of these three institutions are going to do what the regions say, or they won't have a job. Plain and simple. So I don't think we need to put an extra burden on the Fort Valley States, the Albany, and the Savannahs. That should come from the regions by doing programmatic programs that will help increase the student body at those particular schools. And that will bring about economic development in those particular communities, in those neighborhoods. So my objection is that uh, for the private institutions, they are a little bit different. They are not controlled by the Board of Regents. So I would ask you to vote no on this bill. And if you want to do something, let's go to the Board of Regents and ask that they make the changes 
at those particular institutions that would increase the student body and that would spur economic development. For that, there are no questions. Mr. President, I yield the way. There are no questions, sir. You want me? Recognize Senator from the 12th. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, there are days when you feel a little bit like David and Goliath, you know, and me being David today, I still need to say some things about this bill. Colleagues, I rise to voice strong opposition to SB 235, which is being touted as an economic development bill to rebuild and clear away the blight where our HBCUs have existed for over a century. And for that economic fo focus, as alumni, we are extremely grateful. We're grateful that you're thinking about us. But colleagues, as this bill is written, SB 235 will empower a very loosely defined and appointed commission to institute a complete power grab away from the Board of Regents with little to no oversight or accountability for this legislative body, nor oversight or accountability from the Board of Regents. SB 235 is a redistribution of power, resources, and the leadership. This is very much a bill of opportunity for some. Without accountability and oversight, this can become a financial windfall, follow the money, if placed in the wrong hands. If this is such a bold and innovative initiative, why are we excluding the predominantly white institutions? There are PWIs in blighted communities as well. After all, Georgia became the number one place to do business by using resources from all campuses in some meaningful way, but not through exclusionary methods. Just put these HBCUs over here and we kind of forget about them. The creation of this commission in itself will be very subjective and create several new layers of even more bureaucracy for HBCUs to navigate. Line 71 through 72 states that the commission shall employ an executive director who shall manage the work and accounts of the commission. This directly competes and conflicts with the fiduciary responsibilities of the state's chancellor and board of regents. All of these operations can take place through regents right now. Why are we separating our HBCU institutions? Are we easy pickings? for those with very little interest or support for these schools. HB 235s will disenfranchise and usurp local government authorities, create a separate and independent group that shall raise money with very little oversight and freely, and they shall freely distribute these funds again, without any accountability or oversight. Lines 140 through 146 states that in carrying out the purposes of this article, the commission shall be authorized to contract with, apply for, and accept gifts, loans, grants, 
federal, state, or local governments, public agencies, semi-public agencies, or private organizations, and shall be able to expend or use such funds for the benefit of each planning district according to its identified priorities. Who will determine when, where, and how monies will or shall be distributed? Are we creating an atmosphere of winners and losers with such a commission coming out of the wild, wild west? Public HBCU presidents are attached to and report to the Chancellor and Board of, Ed of Regents. Are HBCU presidents no longer expected to report to these entities? Again, as this bill is written, it separates HBCU schools from the security, dignity, and control of our state, and it places public HBCUs in the hands of God knows who. SB 235, line 131, states that the proposed commission shall be authorized to enter into all contracts or agreements necessary or incidental to the performance of its duties. Again, where are the checks and balances? This redistribution of power is also in direct opposition to the intent of Brown versus the Board of Education. 70 years ago, this ruling declared that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. The decision overturned the previous doctrine of separate but equal which allowed for racially segregated facilities as long as they were deemed equal by somebody's standards. Brown versus the Board of Education was dismantled. This legal framework and no longer exists because it was known to be inherently unequal. In this state that is touted as the best place to do business, why are we separating our colleges and universities, their resources? Will HBCUs no longer receive the same resources from regents? Are we sending the wrong message to our business communities? Are we placing our schools and communities in peril with new layers of bureaucracy? Does this separate and remove us from regents and send our institutions to a very loosely formed commission whose power appears to even surpass that of regents? How will this bill protect our institutions from bad actors who see this as an opportunity to make money? Is the intent of this bill to take HBCUs back to a very dark and uncertain time in history when we were separate and unequal? Will HBCUs continue to lose more than what they presently receive from regions or from the state? And colleagues, before I close, let me remind you all that we have been down this road at least three different sessions. We have been told that this bill is different from SB 278 that was introduced in 2019. And it is. It is far more dangerous and treacherous than SB 278. So let's revisit the murky trail of SB 235 that originated as SB 278. SB 278 simply afforded the institutions, the HBCUs, the ability to become an independent state, an HBCU of the system, an HBCU system. SB 278 said that HBCUs would have their own board and chancellor, trustees, and university presidents would be selected by their own boards. SB 278 suggested a 19-member board of trustees for a state HBCU system that would again select its own chancellor and individual presidents. It also referenced Tennessee State University as being a model for 
all HBCUs across the country because they, they had an independent board. So let's fast forward to where we are with Tennessee State. Currently, a Senate panel is backing legislation to move and vacate TSU's Board of Trustees because of its total disruptive nature, sending Tennessee State University spiraling out of control, and especially due to judiciary obligations that they managed so poorly. Regents has the power to appoint, delegate, hire, and fix all of the concerns of this bill, especially economic concerns. Why do we need to add an unaccountable commission to this HBCU story? Regents provide us with the resources for our campuses, along with the leadership. Colleagues, I implore you to take a real deep dive into this bill. Save our HBCUs from a takeover by nobody we can identify yet. And even when they're in place, are we to trust their motives? I want only to ask that we remove our public HBCUs from the bill and allow regents to solve these issues that have plagued our schools for decades, including but not limited to resources, finances, and just as important, leadership. Every success touted by the senator from the 39th occurred under regents. So why are we handing these HBCUs over to the unknown? Thank you, colleagues, and I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. Bringing out the Senator from the 43rd. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I rise as a proud HBCU grad, and only two senators before me are HBC that have spoken before me are HBCU grads. And yes, we are black, beautiful, bold, and brilliant. Yes, we produce entrepreneurs, doctors, lawyers, and veterinarians. This bill. I rise in opposition to. This is the third attempt on an assault to Georgia's HBCUs. It's the same bill, different presenter. Same hidden agenda and messages behind the scenes. This bill weakens the strength of HBCUs it remains to be seen the who, what, when, where, and the whys. Why do you keep reaching and grabbing for control of our HBCUs? And folks who aren't graduates, as you could see on the board earlier, were all about supporting it. September, AJC had an article in the paper about Georgia's HBCUs. And the author wrote, while most of the HBCUs are private, three of those schools are public and part of the university system of Georgia, which receives state funding to operate. The heads of two federal departments wrote a letter, this was back in September, on Monday, 
to the governor of several states, including Georgia's Governor Kemp, raising concerns that the land-grant HBCUs have been underfunded by their states. Further, two uh, state representatives called for, back in October, wrote an article in the AJC, called for the governor to address the gaps in funding for the state's historically black colleges and universities. Colleges in the Atlanta University Center are private, therefore they don't receive funding. But the HBCUs that receive funding from the state are Albany State, Fort Valley State, and Savannah State. In the US Secretary Miguel Cardono's letter, he said Fort Valley State, a land grant HBCU has been underfunded for years. He cites the state's gap in funding is more than $600 million. These funds could have supported infrastructure and student services and would have better positioned the universities to uh, have uh, research grants. The letter from the Biden administration called on a dozen state governors to address the funding disparity for land-grant HBCUs and including the state of Georgia. If we expand, if, if we extend our energy to calling on the leadership of this state to receive the federal funding that it so richly deserves, that our HBCUs will be in a better place. If we would expend our energy instead of uh, trying to figure a way around and instead of a way through um, to receive the federal funding, this bill wouldn't be necessary. Generations will fall behind further and be further disenfranchised if this bill passes. Thank you, Mr. President. And if I don't have any questions, I will yield the well. I have one question. Thank you. You do have a question, Senator. Senator from the 44th. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Does the Senator yield? I do. I'm real concerned about this. Um, as an HBCU grad, I'm trying to see, um, and you might can shed a little light on this. Um, I don't want us to, um, the, the private institutions that we have, especially the, ACU, the Atlanta University Center Complex and Payne College, those schools have been raising money for years. Uh, uh, um, the alumni, uh, from all these schools, other entities have been doing all they can to, to, to make ends meet and to raise funds for these schools. Uh, so they, they're in pretty good shape for this. But the three institutions of Georgia, Savannah State, Fort Valley State, and Albany State, um, will not be treated fairly, <laughs> is what I think. And I, I wanted you to shed a little light on that. If these other pri uh, private institutions uh, will do great things under this bill, but then the three institutions that are public, that are run by the Board of Regents, who are supposed to give them money fairly, uh, will not be treated fairly. Uh, I'm just trying to see how this will will help those institutions. I was disturbed when I saw the report that uh, Fort Valley State, the land grant institution, Fort Valley State uh, uh, should have been given $600 million more uh, all these years, and they haven't done anything. And then uh, the government, they was called on for the state of Georgia to do that, do right about those schools, and do right, uh, do right about those schools, and do right about uh, giving Fort Valley the money. And to this date, that has not been done. So it seems as if what we're trying to do is to go ahead and discard that and make some other rule uh, for the regions. If the regions would do what they're supposed to do and, and make it available. Senator, these Senator, <laughs> Senator, if you have a question, you're free to ask it. But if you want to talk, then ask it okay. to come up front well, and talk. Well, that was my question. Would you please elaborate okay. on that? 
the gentleman, the gentlewoman knows of what she speaks. Um, the um, not just Georgia HBCUs, but HBCUs nationally have been underfunded. Um, but this particular bill um, should not m move any um, schools from under um, the University Systems of Georgia. It, it really is not a, a, a good move and it is not a good thing. Um, so I am in opposition of this bill and I ask that uh, you would um, consider and do the same. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the will. Thank you, Senator. Bring now, Senator from second. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I rise in support of SB 235. I am a life member of the Savannah State National Alumni Association. I, too, am a graduate of an HBCU. And in fact, when I first attended the HBCU, Savannah State University, in 2007, I flunked out. Party a little too hard. But I want to clarify a couple things about this bill that it doesn't do. Uh, we talk about the Board of Regents and the appointments of the Board of Regents, which are confirmed by this body. We've confirmed Regents while I've been in this biennium, and I've heard no objection. Let's talk about how money is appropriated to the university system of Georgia. The state constitution, page 65, paragraph 1, says, There shall be a board of regents of the university system of Georgia, which shall consist of one member of each congressional district in the state and five additional members from the state at large, appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate. All folks on the Board of Regents are nominated by the governor and confirmed by this body. Line B, the Board of Regents shall have exclusive authority. Doesn't say some authority, doesn't say a little bit of authority, it says exclusive authority. To create new public colleges, junior colleges and universities in the state of Georgia, subject to the approval by a majority vote in the House of Representatives and the Senate, doesn't say a constitutional majority, it just says a majority. And it also says the government control and management of the University System of Georgia and all of the institutions in said system shall be vested in the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia. We talk about appropriations. The state constitution says that all appropriations made for the use of any or all institutions in the university system shall be paid to the Board of Regents in a lump sum, meaning colleagues, you and I in the General Assembly cannot direct funding to any college in the university system of Georgia. What that means is that the Board of Regents gets their money in a block grant and distributes it based off its own internal funding formula. You and this body have no control over that. The Board of Regents may hold, purchase, lease, sell, convey, or otherwise dispose of public property, execute conveyances thereon, and utilize the proceeds arising therefrom, and may exercise the power of eminent domain in the, in the manner provided by law, and shall have such other powers and duties as provided by law. Here it is that it's the Board of Regents that control all of the real estate, all of the property, all of the assets of any one institution. Now this bill that my colleague, the senator from the 39th has, I understand it creates a little bit of uncertainty because we fear what we do not know. But what we do know is that the communities that surround HBCUs need help. We know that they need revitalization. We know that there are other things that could be done, but guess what, it's outside of the gate of the university. So the university is not focused on the things outside of the university, it's only focused on its operations within the campus. The senator from Macon talked about marine biology. We do have marine biology at Savannah State, but I'll tell you what happened. There was a parcel of property that came available further down the river, but Savannah State was not in the posture and neither the position to be able to acquire the real estate. That would have been something this planning district would have been able to know and plan for. Because those who do not plan do what? Plan to fail. And if planning gives us consternation, well, I would just tell you that it is the lack of planning and what we're talking about to do something different that we have not seen before. And if this bill blows up and I'm still in the Georgia General Assembly, then colleagues, I'll take my licks and keep on ticking. But I don't think that will happen in this bill. This bill only talks about the planning, it talks about what happens in the communities surrounding those HBCUs. 
We voted for CIDs in this state, community improvement districts. Look at this like a community improvement district. This is revitalization. That's all this is, making our campuses more attractive by looking at what's happening around us, leveraging new market tax credits and new financing to be able to make something happen for these institutions. Now, we all agree that HBCUs could need a little bit more money. Absolutely. We, they need absolutely some more help. But what I will not do, colleagues, is vote against something that could be a tool in the toolbox to give them additional help. That's all this bill does. And if there are issues with how money is promulgated, then I would like to sign on to a bill by my colleagues to bring that power back to the Georgia General Assembly. That's a two-thirds vote. You want to change the blue book. So I welcome the opportunity to change how we appropriate money in this state. Because I think that you are here, and I'm here to be a legislator. But uh, as the senator from the 27th knows, uh, we got a lot of big government, and they have the ability to set and promulgate their own rules. They got a lot of stuff that's constitutionally Right here, that's what they got in this blue book. Senator from the 19th can't direct any funding, any funding, tell them where to put money, send money to what schools. We don't have the power to do that. It goes to the university system in a block grant. They distribute it how they see fit. So it's up to the university system, the Board of Regents, to distribute the funds as they see fit. And as I close, Mr. President, I'm reminding this body again, when we appointed regents, I heard no objection to any of the regents appointed. I heard no objection for the appointments to the Board of Regents, the University System of Georgia. I heard no objections. And this bill grants House, Senate, Governor's Office, the opportunity to place people in those communities. As an HBCU alumni, I am sure there are other alumni from my institution that disagree with me on this. And that's all right. We agree to disagree, but I pray that we're not disagreeable. I ask my colleagues for their favorable, favorable consideration and vote yes, because this is a tool in the toolbox. If not, We'll just keep holding court talking about uh, what it could be. And in closing, my grandmother would say, ifs and buts, uh, if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, it'd be Christmas every day. And with that, Mr. President, I yield a well. Senator from the 55th. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I rise up today to support Senate Bill 235. My good friend from the 39th has worked hard to get us here today. Over the last two years, she chaired a study committee. She toured the HBCUs across our state, and today, she presents legislation that will help secure the economic future of HBCUs and their surrounding communities. And how appropriate that we pass Senate Bill 235 in Atlanta. In many ways, this, this city is the spiritual home of HBCUs. In 1865, Atlanta University became the first Southern school to award black students with bachelor's degrees and the first in our country to award graduate degrees to black students. Standing in the heart of the old Confederacy, Atlanta University stood as Atlanta's monument to black hope and excellence and quickly became the center of American black intellectual life. Today, the Atlanta University Center is still a monument to black hope and excellence. Spelman College, Clark Atlanta, Morehouse, Morehouse School of Medicine, Morris Brown and ITC are crown jewels of our city. And outside Atlanta, hope and excellence reign as well. Fort Valley State, Savannah State, Albany State, and Payne College. Georgia is blessed with HBCU riches. Unfortunately, disinvestment and underinvestment 
have affected both our HBCUs and their surrounding communities. While lawsuits alleging underfunding are sprouting up in states, including ours, this legislation is an opportunity to access resources beyond the state and the communities surrounding these schools badly need access to those resources. Black children from the low wealth centrist track around Georgia HBCUs live with family incomes well below the federal poverty level and often lack access to high speed internet. These schools may be monuments of hope and promises of a better tomorrow, but all too often, the communities surrounding these schools fight so hard to make it through the day that they can't worry about a better tomorrow. Senate Bill 235 helps us restore hope in these communities. It creates five planning districts to help bring sustainable economic development to community around these schools. It also gives HBCUs a seat at the table with the state of Georgia and lets these vital institutions explain why Georgia benefits, benefits from them and why our state should stop overlooking these schools and their communities. Colleagues, I am very proud to support this le legislation and I ask all of you to join me in supporting 235 with a green light. Mr. President, I'm sure there are no questions for me, so I'll leave you, you well. You do have one question, Senator. All right. What's the Senator from the 35th. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Madam Leader, will you yield? I'll yield, yes. Um, I am a proud uh, graduate and alum of uh, Morris Brown College. Mm -hmm. My late husband and my father both graduated from Morehouse College. My mother and my older sister from Spelman. My sister in between there from Clark Atlanta. In other words, we touched all of the, most of my son graduated from uh, Savannah State. My grandson is, is over there. And so need, isn't need, it need true, a form of the question. There you isn't go. it true? <laughs> That Morris Brown College does not be, appear to be on here and to be a part of this. So does this not include Morris Brown College? Actually, I did say Morris Brown College. It I is want her included. to answer it. Hmm? It is included. Okay, it says uh, on line 80, the commission shall establish. So they won't have an advisory committee then, right? Because from uh, all the way, so it's going to be com included in the Atlanta University. It's my understanding, Senator, that Mars Brown College is included. If not, the senator from the 39th would would have to welcome. Tell. Is it because it doesn't amendment. say it in here? I, I know it says consortium, but it doesn't. But it doesn't say Mars no, Brown. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I think in black and white it ought to say Mars Brown College in there as well because we have a lot of alums who would really be supporting this, this, and then hoping that Mars Brown could be helped because you know they lost accreditation. They fought for 20 years to stay afloat. They've never stopped teaching students. And, and right now they've earned their accreditation back and haven't, you know, so S they, Senator, they Senator, need to be Senator. on this. And that's we why need, I want to know what's on it. Need it in the form of a question, Senator. I'm, I'm that's, sure the, that's the question, is where, that's, where is the name? I'm sure the Senator knows of what she speaks and if there is an amendment that could be offered if Mars Brown College is not there, I'm sure the Senator from the 39th would welcome that. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. President, I yield well. All right, thank you, Senator. Does any other Senator wish to speak for or against the measure? All right, Senator from 39, close debate. Well, 
We have heard a lot of hyperbole. Between SB 278, we heard about the Brown versus the Board of Education. We heard about people or HBCU graduates or not. The reality is every single one of us in this room have a responsibility to make sure that those schools have resources and that those communities have investment. So the idea that this bill is unnecessary is clearly untrue. All you have to do is look around and step foot on any of these campuses. The senator from the, I can't read, but Macon talked about, 26, 26 said, if you want to improve our state's HBCUs, put a marine school in, put a vet school in. We need the money from the regions. I don't disagree, but that is not happening. So this bill right here is an approach and a way to have an all of the above strategy. The, the senator from the 44th asked the question about the letter from the US Department of Education that said to our state and said to our regions that Fort Valley State University in just a 30-year period was underfunded by $603 million. Is that money coming? Shall we just wait? Or shall we say there is an opportunity to create something that can allow us to have the resources that the schools need? They need to modernize. Their, their campuses, they have to improve infrastructure. They need institutional capacity. The Regents has all of the ability to do these things, and they may. But in the meantime, that doesn't mean that you cannot have a multi-pronged strategy. This bill offers that strategy. I wasn't here for SB 278, that predates me. I don't know the first thing about that bill, but what I do know is that we have created military job tax credit zones. And guess what? Our bases don't change their reporting structure just because there's a military zone. In New Orleans, in 2005, and let me just say, this is just a new twist on a very old idea. The only twist is that it's for our HBCUs, but innovation and prosperity zones and opportunity zones and CIDs have existed forever. And they've emerged as a policy tool to promote workforce development, economic, economic development, and economically disadvantaged communities across our state and our country. This is no different than that. We can imagine all we want to, but at the end of the day, nothing that you heard from the people who spoke out against this bill offers a solution. This is a solution. And I would like to add that this 24-page report that came out of the recommendation of the study committee, two of the people who spoke against the bill were on the committee. Everybody had a year to talk about their problems with the bill. A year that this bill was dropped. A year, nobody said a word. Nobody came up and said, here's how we can ameliorate this bill in a year's time. Nobody said, I have a different solution. Get with me, maybe we can do something different for our HBCUs, not a peep. So today, I urge you to vote yes, vote yes for a vision that helps secure the resources that these schools and these communities need. Vote yes for our HBCUs. Vote yes for investment that will allow them to modernize their campuses, increase their institutional capacity, improve the infrastructure. Vote yes on Georgia leading. Vote yes on our HBCUs starting to have some of the things that they need to do the things that we all know that they can do. They have been punching well above their weight from the inception. Well above their weight from the inception. All around us, states are being sued, sued because their regions or the state have not invested in HBCUs. So far, there has been word, of course, an announcement that Georgia's going to be sued but I don't know that that's been brought forward. So this bill allows us to begin to see a pathway for the schools. There is a reason why you have so many support letters on that desk. 
So I urge you to vote yes. I urge you to understand that this does not separate the schools from the regents, who still has control over the schools, and can work, frankly, hand in hand, and should, is encouraged to, with the schools so that they can have what they need to, to build the students that they help and the workforce that our state needs. This is a workforce development conversation. Our students are that pipeline to a talented, diverse, skilled workforce in the state. They need more. Vote yes for the kids who every single day choose to stay in Georgia and go to these 10 schools. Thank you very much. I yield the well. Senator has yielded, Senator. There's a late arriving amendment, Senator, and, uh, and we had already called the question, and there was a reason why we had the Senator from the 30 night to, uh, to end debate. Um, so the amendment's gonna be out of order right now because it was too late arriving, so. All right, the previous question has been ordered Questions on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is there objections to the adoption of the committee substitute? Hearing none, the committee substitute is adopted. Is there objection to agreeing to the reported committee which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair hears none, the reported committee is agreed to. Is there objection to the main question being ordered? Chair hears none, the main question is ordered. Questions on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor of the bill vote yay, opposed nay. Secretary unlock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 46 and nays are seven. This bill having seen the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed by substitute. All right, so we're gonna take a little bit of a break. I thought we'd get finished with five bills before uh, before 1.30, but apparently y'all had something else on your mind. So, um, but we're gonna take a little break and um, uh, let's get back here. We'll, we'll get back here right at, uh, right at three o'clock. So it's, two, it's almost 2.10 right now, so right at three o'clock. Senator from the first, for what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, I just, uh 
parliamentary inquiry. Uh, is it inquiry. not true that uh, HHS is going to be meeting uh, for uh, a few minutes uh, upon our break? The senator from the first, the chairs, HHS says they're going to be meeting for a little bit. His committee is going to be meeting at 2 o'clock. All right, so y'all will meet right now. So, And I'm sure at the usual, usual place. All right, we're going to stand in recess for uh, till 3 o'clock. Thank you.